What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, Dan, I love hearing about the challenge stories. Um, people listen here over and over. You know, I had uh, someone on, Moise Navone of Mobileye. They ended up selling their company. They're fueling the autonomous fuel, uh, autonomous car revolution. Um, they got acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. Um, and what was cool about a story, though, is when you know in this journey, this up and down journey, that yeah. he had to go home to his kid. They had to cut his salary. It was taking much longer to reach where they wanted to go. They had to cut his salary multiple times, and he had to go home to his wife and kids and basically like, oh, we're pulling you out of all extracurricular activities. There's no niceties. There's no eating out. There's no nothing. We're going to have to survive off what we need to survive off of now. You know, and that was reality. And that's what we we only hear like sometimes the success on the other side. We don't hear about those crazy times, um, the up, up and down journey. So I love hearing those stories. So you can check out more of those at inspiredinsider.com. Some of the real stories along the journey, right? Um, yes. And and uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help people reach their dream 100 clients and referral partners with a podcast with actually generating ROI with the podcast and giving to people, giving your best relationships with the podcast. And you can check it out. We've been doing it for uh, over 10 years ourselves, helping other people. And it's led to tremendous relationships um, and really Dan and I's relationship here today. And so if you have questions or if you, you could check out more at rise25.com. And I'm gonna introduce today's guest who I consider a, a really good friend and a colleague and a mentor to me. And I've got to know him over the past many years and um, I've had him on the podcast previously. And like I always tell people, Dan, the podcast, I've gone to people's weddings, I've gone on family vacations, I've whatever, and this is the case with you, whenever we're in the same city, we will get together and hang out. And um, Dan Cashel is an accomplished entrepreneur and business coach and formerly CEO of Genius Network. He's run 11 companies since 1992. He's built up multiple businesses to revenues exceeding eight figures and one of his businesses to a staff of over 170 people before selling it. He runs Breakthrough 3X um, and he helps founders and entrepreneurs 3X your profits and impact, but not your stress, which is a key component. Yes. And He's coached over 5,000 business owners and had over 200,000 clients and over a million people have enjoyed his educational resources. You can also check out his podcast, which is amazing, at growthtofreedom.com. And you can check out more at breakthrough3x.com. And his fun fact is he played college baseball. Yes. Dan, thanks for joining me. I totally appreciate it. Brother, it's amazing to be with you again today. You know, I want to do something lately um, of kind of a series of people I consider when I think of the biggest givers in the universe who just value relationships, who are amazing at giving to people. Um, and you're one of those people I think of, Thank you, you know, you. besides everything I just read, that doesn't matter to me. Okay. What matters is someone's an amazing human being and they give to other people with relationships. And that's what you are just amazing at. And I wanted to start off talking about that, the value of relationships. And maybe, you know, we met through you know, uh, uh, a way, and you've done many, many interviews yourself. Okay. And, um, there's several ways you are really good at building and uh, maintaining relationships. And one I see is you send out regular actual physical things in the mail. Yes. yes. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. I Do mean, people think direct mail is dead. Direct mail is dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad people think it is because it allows those of us using it to actually do well from it. Uh, it's not as crowded as other places. So that's, that's a little insect right there. Um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, we all love to feel special, right? And so, you know, years ago, uh, you know, this would have been back in like in the early 1990s, I read a book about a guy named Joe Girard. And he was the top uh, salesperson in the world at the time. And there was like a five year stretch with no fleet sales and car sales that he had, you know, made like 11,000 sales 
in five years, which if you do the math is pretty incredible in and of itself. So he exponentially outperformed everybody in the book. It talked about they essentially asked him the question, like, what was a couple of the key things that you did? And he said, what I did is for my potential clients and my clients is once a month, I would send out or once a month or once a quarter, I would send out physical cards to them. And then he would put something like, P.S. I love you. Right. Uh, Or you're special or some kind of motivating message to stay connected to them. Right. Because. There, there is an ROI squared that gives you an ROI cubed, right? Now, you might ask, well, what is ROI squared equals ROI cubed? See, it's not the ROI you think. See, number one, it's return on interaction. Like, what is the interaction you have with a, with a, with a colleague, a peer, a, a potential client, a, a, a current client, past client, alumni, whatever you want to call it, right? There's an R, a return on interaction. Right. Lots of people will do like Christmas cards. Right. You know, but I got a lot from Joe Girard and his idea where he said once a month. Now, I'm not as good as Joe, but I, I try to be very thoughtful and have, you know, for many, many years of doing this historically and with regularity and with consistency, where about four, maybe five, maybe even is up up to six times a year. We send out, you know, you know, we get, you know, think about it. You send out probably a Christmas version of a Christmas card and we all kind of get in this ritual and habit of doing that. You know, and many people today have opted for the family photo where it's kind of showing some, you know, things that have happened in the last, you know, few months or whatever the case might be. Well, what if you extended that annually and every quarter or so, just maybe in four times a year, you put your photo card together, then you may get useful for them. So you go one step beyond just showing you because, you know, people don't care about you and I that much. They care about themselves. So what we do is we, because we interview a lot of people, but you can go research these and just find them and put valuable quotes on the back of the card. So now they get the back of the card. It's valuable to them. It gives them an inspiration, a thought. We you typically will put like nine minimum of nine quotes on the back. Now, typically, these are interviews we've done. On top of that, we've got another layer, which is putting together usually can be anywhere from a half a page, a page to sometimes it's been as many as eight pages of insights we've gotten from what we have done in the last quarter. And we put that in there. And so we send it out to the people that have come into our world. And, you know, the regularly when we send this out, Jeremy, what ends up happening is I'll end up getting texts, you know, all kinds. And many of these people I've never physically even met before, but I'll get texts. Oh my God, this really struck me. I have people go, man, I've got this pasted up on my wall and I use it as my guide. I'm using it as my guide for the next quarter. These are sometimes not even clients uh, as well. And then we have clients who go, man, that one thing you shared just reinforced something that we have been doing together. Thank you. Right. So we get emails like that, texts like that. So it's it's a great multiplier and it keeps you in front of people in a non crowded place, which is the mail. Right. So ROI, the first part of ROI squared is return on interaction, creating interactions in unique ways that no one else is likely doing in your market. So physical mail is unique than what most people because most people are too lazy and cheap to do it. And, And I don't mean that offensively, but it is what it is right? Just get outside the box a little bit and and create interactions. That's number one. Number two, ROI squared is return on implementation. Like chances are, as you're listening or you're watching, right? You probably need a new idea. Like you need a damn hole in your head, right? Right. We all have lots of ideas. Creative entrepreneurs have thousands of ideas. Return on implementation, right? You get an idea. What's your method to implement, right? Now, There's all kinds of ways to implement, but there's a lot of ways that get in the way of implementing. And what it reminds me of is, uh, Jeremy, is, uh, you know, this uh, recent example of a client that's come into our world. Really blessed to work with this guy. But like he's in an unusual case because he's in an industry that most people look at that industry where they would not want to serve this industry. They would not want to have clients in this industry. And you'll understand why in a second when I describe it. His name is Bruce. And Bruce is in the art industry. And, you know, if you think of that industry historically, it's like, you know, starving artist, right? Starving artist. And guess like, what? Who do you not want to, like, you know, if Dan Kenny's, who has money? And it's like students and artists is not really a good yes, niche. Exactly. It's crazy, right? So, but he got uh, re- uh, referred to us, which, you know, obviously it's the highest compliment in the world. He got recommended to us and said, these guys can really help you. And so we talked and here's what Bruce was facing. Bruce 
was like a lot of people, like I've been over the years, having 11 companies as, as we share this, Jeremy, and I, I like to share as you know, that means I've had a lot of failure too. I mean, I crashed three of those 11 companies. Now, granted, the other eight were either seven or eight figure plus companies. Grateful, two of them I was lucky enough to sell, now being able to, to you know, buy companies, sell companies. It's been, you know, been so, so incredibly grateful and I'm blessed for all that, right? But I try not to forget a lot of the mistakes too, because if you forget where you come from, you're on your way back. So Bruce, he comes, comes to us, we're having a chat and he's like, I mean, you can just, you know, think, think of your situation, your situation as you're listening or watching right now, you're like, if you, you know, struggling with burnout, struggling with overwhelm, struggling with confusion, right? He was studying like nine different experts and he was being recommended all these different technology platforms. And I won't mention the tech because a lot of them are really amazing platforms, but he was like, I'm going to do this program for my webinar and I'm going to connect it to this process for my uh, online follow-up sequence and my CRM and blah, blah, blah. And he was all, and he was just completely and utterly confused and overwhelmed. Uh, an artist trying to, trying to make, he's an artist for Christ's sake. He's not like a marketer, right? And I said, Bruce, time out, dude. We're going we're gonna to solve this. It's about the ROI, return on implementation. So what did we do? We said, you know what? What do you want to do? And so through the process of understanding him, he loves teaching art. He loves helping people tap into creativity to free themselves and tap into a creative side that maybe they hadn't experienced since they were kids and get out of their comfort zone and, you know, kind of paint your life through painting, right? You know, get creative, get the colors out versus most people living in existence or living in black and white. And so he was like, that's what I want to do. And I said, well, what would you offer? And so we work long and the short, we help him come up basically his version of a coaching training program for a year. And then instead of going all the technical and creating funnels and creating automation and creating, you know, these, these crazy things that they do work. But again, he's an artist, not a marketer, maybe like you, right? He's not a professional at this, right? He hasn't spent 10,000 hours to solve what works, what doesn't, and how to get it in place like that. For him, his art is his 10,000 hours. So what did we do? I said, hey, Bruce, let's run this over here on Zoom. Let's keep it super simple. Let, let us help you help frame your presentation. And here's what he did, Jeremy. He took action, first of all, return on implementation. He was, he's like, he, I, he appreciated the simplicity. You know, it was a great quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. He says, you know, I'd rather... Uh, I wouldn't give a fig to be on the other side of complexity, but I'd give my life to be on this side of simplicity. Isn't that true? Think about it as you're watching, right? As you're listening, isn't that true? Right? It's so true. So incredibly important to really tune in with that. The simpler we make it for our clients to help them save time, save money, make it easier, right? Convenience. Like, how can we do that? Yeah, we could have talked to Bruce about automation. I mean, for our private clients, Jeremy, as you know, we help them build a lot of this. We help implement a lot of these things. But we said, let's skip all that. Just put it in Zoom. We helped him write the description, come up with it. And then he had a list of only 400 people in his universe. And he said, okay, just invite him to come to the webinar, right? And what ended up happening, he set up the webinar, or the, not the webinar, but a meeting. So we didn't even do a webinar. We didn't even want to get that technical. He said, just set up, a, have you ever set up a meeting in Zoom? He goes, yeah, I've done that a couple. I said, just do the same. But we're going to have people fill in their information first so that you can get the info of who they are, their name, their phone number, et cetera, email address. So we did that through Zoom, through a Zoom meeting, right? Which again, breaks so many different rules from typical marketing uh, expertise. And uh, so, but he took action. You just want to get so it started. Get it started, get it going. He invited the 400 people, get this, Jeremy, this like is going to blow you away, blew me away, frankly, because I expect, okay, 400 is going to be 40 who respond and you know, there'll be a handful. Anyway, he got 122 people to register for the, his free training through the through, through this process. And he had 92 people show up on the very first one. Now, keep in mind, as you're watching or listening right now, at the time we're doing this, this was four weeks ago, four weeks ago, Thursday. First one, he did his presentation. He broke a lot of rules. His presentation, is, you know, he didn't know how to do a perfect, um, I don't want to use the name, but a perfect presentation, we'll call it, to sell people. No, he's an artist. He went three and a half hours. He made his offer in about three hours. Breaks all kinds of rules. Three hours. Three wow. hours. He had four people, five people enroll in his coaching training program. First one. Now, this is where most people would stop. And, you know, either they'd be excited or depressed or somewhere in the middle. And then they'd Why go. people it. show up, Dan, I'd be excited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. 92. Like three people watching this right now. I'm excited about that. Greg yeah. Roulette likes this. I'm excited about that. 
That's awesome. 92, anyway. 92 people, yeah. right? Show up for this thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, amazing. And uh, so we talked to him afterward, go, how did it go? He go, four or five clients. When did you do the thing? He said, oh, we made the invitation to move forward and our offer in about three hours. And I'm like, oh, okay. But he goes, I love this. This is what I want to do. He goes, what should we do? Should we now build the auto? I'm like, nope. How about we just do the same thing over again? You had 122 people. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to recraft your offer and we're going to do it in about 40 minutes and make that. And then you continue your content. Even if you want to continue to do three hours, which he did, then you just continue to do content and then seed the offer, do another set of content, seed the offer over the time, right? Second one. Now, see, this is where most people would have stopped, though, the first one and regrouped and waited two months to do the next webinar. And he would have been sitting on four clients. And there's a really important part of that return on interaction. You're going to hear that as I explain his model, what we did and helped him do. And number two, the ROI, which is return on implementation. Keep it simple, right? Keep it. My dad used to say when I was a kid, Jeremy, Dan, keep it simple, stupid. And he'd almost say it with that stern of a voice at, at times too. So that, that would be kind of, I'm getting flashbacks right now, by the way, <laughs> my dad, like with that stern look in his eyes. Uh, anyway, I digress just a tad. So he goes, I love this. I, I go, awesome. Why don't you do it next week? He goes, okay, yeah, I'll do it next week. So he repeats the process. He has 275 people register for the second one. Wow. He has 202 show up. He makes the offer now earlier and then he seeds it a couple of times through the rest of his content, right? And he has 19 new enrollments. We talk again, go, how'd it go? He goes, it was amazing. I love this. I want to keep doing this. I go, well, let's do it again next week. This is a week ago, Thursday. He does it. He enrolls another 19 clients. He just did it again yesterday. And I think he got like six, five or six new clients from it. Right. And what's so amazing, had he stopped at the first one and waited 60 days, he would have been delaying his ability to impact people. But based on the power of ROI, return on interaction consistently, right? This many times that long, they got to see it repeatedly and understand it more and more comfortable. I'll tell a story about this and why this is so critically important. And, and number two is the return on implementation to just keep it simple and take action, right? So let me just hit a timeout, Jerry. What, what are your thoughts Some on Some people all? may, that may be counterintuitive. Like, well, I don't want to flood my people with something so frequently or so often. What do you say to those people? You're I mean, obviously that. the proof's in the pudding, but that some people would not not have listened to your advice because they think, well, I just did one. I want to give them a break from emails and yep. see my presentation. You're saying the opposite, which is I love counter, you know, counterintuitive advice because the more they see it, the more they understand it, the more they're familiar with it and it actually increased her, his number of registrants and show ups. Yeah. So let me, let me give, give a thought on that. So one, you know, is it possible that that way of thinking, if someone is thinking, if you're thinking that, right now as you're listening or watching, could that be holding you back from your bigger future? Is it possible that that could be a limiting belief getting in the way you actually, you're letting, you know, whatever that voice of doubt is, or the idea of it's gotta be more automated or it's gotta be more space or it's gotta be more technical than this, get in the way of you actually making money. Personally, I've met a lot of our clients and see a lot of people I've talked to over the last decade plus that are letting automation and they're letting technology get in the way of them making money and having an impact and helping people. The end of the day, if you follow this advice, it's my belief and from results, data tells us this, ROI squared, return on interaction, return on implementation gives you ROI three, which is tripling your business done right. And at the end of the day, isn't that what you want? You wanna grow your impact? You wanna have the ability to make more money, right? At, plus what it gives you the ability to do is you eliminate risk this way. You eliminate risk because of frequency of communication, right? The return on interaction. So you eliminate risk. You actually engage people at a much deeper level. So you boost your bottom line. And on top of that, you have the ability to help more people. So if that's the kind of business you're in, then I'd encourage you to like try at least try it. Try it for the next quarter and see where it takes you. See how it impacts your business with this approach. Let me give it. Let me give it a scientific study that was done on this that I stumbled across on a few years back. And you know, it's this idea. And this is kind of an old approach, but I think it'll drive this point home. If you're wondering, 
So back when we were younger, Jeremy, you know, do, if you remember our, our parents or grandparents had these things in their, instead of a refrigerator, they had these things called what? An ice box, right? And so they had an ice box. And I remember the, I, I vaguely remember the transition over from an ice box to a, a refrigerator model. So, you know, usually, you know, like where I grew up in the inner city of Detroit, we had a basement. And so the ice box was down the basement. And then, you know, what would happen is you paid a monthly fee, roughly, I don't know, 20, 25 bucks a month. And the ice guy would come and deliver ice. And then there was a milk guy who would deliver milk. So it was kind of fresh. And they put it in this little side of, the, of our house, right? And then we put the ice down in the ice box and we put the milk down in the thing, right? When we weren't drinking powdered milk, yet, that is. Uh, that's another story for another time. At any rate, what ended up happening, a company came out with it. The first company came out with the idea, Jeremy, where what they would do is they would have this machine and it was revolutionary or so they thought that you plug the machine in, we'll take out your ice box. It won't cost you anything for us to take it out. We won't even charge you to put this thing you plug in the wall in, right? And we'll charge you the same money per month for three years, 36 months, about 20, 25 bucks a month. And at the end of the three years, then you own this machine called a refrigerator. And what happened? Do you realize that when they, that this was going on, this company, this initial company that did this, they were going bankrupt because they were so shocked at the lack of response. And what they found is this. Number one, only about 28, 25% of people took action and bought the refrigerator. And again, they were going bankrupt. So they were in a kind of a panic mode. So what did they do? They send out a follow-up team to go out to the homes that said no and say, hey, curious, what was the reason you decided not to get this? And they'd get into many cases in conversations with the people that had said no. And guess what happened? Just by them following up and asking why not, and then clarifying additionally, in other words, recently, recency or return on interaction, another approximate 20, 25% ended up getting the refrigerator. The third group of people now momentum hit in the market and now there became a wave later where, you know, about 50% of the marketplace just, it was kind of becoming a norm. They jumped on board. And then there's always a fourth category that like, you almost have to make it a federally mandated law before they'll do it, <laughs> right? Like fire alarms and, you know, uh, fire extinguishers, whatever, the, you, know, you know, the transition from beta to, to VCR. Like I remember we, we always seemed to be the last house in the whole country that would ever get these things when we were kids. Um, but it's kind of this way, this model actually shows up in almost every industry today, right? This type of return on interaction or frequency makes makes a huge, huge deal. And ideally, like, what can you take from that, right? What can you take from this story of Bruce and how could you put it? I, here's a couple of ways to think about it. Number one is return on implement, implement, keep it simple. So take the simplest path is the shortest path is likely your best path. Two, um, do take action with return on interaction, right? Over and over and over again, right? In fact, here's a more advanced way of looking at it. So we've been working with a lot of private clients over the last year or so. And is this serving, Jeremy? What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Is this serving? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, but keep going. Yeah. All right. So, um, so we're fortunate and blessed to work with some pretty prominent uh, experts in our private client work that we do. And so there's been over the few years, millions of dollars invested in different types of advertising. Here's something staggering we found through multiple clients, not just a client, but multiple. For those that are using like this education-based platform, now there's all kinds of names for it. And, and you could call it video content, right? You could call it webinars, you can call it video sales letters, you can call it, uh, you know, teleseminars if you're still using, which we have a client in the health industry that is using that model still and still doing incredibly well which is also counterintuitive and, and more, right? So whatever the, it, it's just valued content, education-based content that's put out there, right? So whatever your ver, ver words are, as you're listening or watching, whatever it is, it is what it is. I'm going to use the term webinar generically because a lot of people seem to be, but if you're not familiar with like the term web, just consider it's educational-based content. Like it could be a video, it could be an audio, it could be uh, multiple things. So through all this advertising, here's what we're finding. That when we have people who come into a model, we see exponential numbers in enrollments, meaning people buying something. When they've attended two webinars, 
and engaged in one list building type type of tool, like a download this checklist, download this guide, download this free tool, two webinars, and this list building tool. Exponential numbers of conversion of people who become purchasers. So here's the thing to think about. Going back to ROI squared to ROI cubed. A lot of people will do a webinar, kind of like using the example of Bruce. They'll do that one and then they'll take a break for months, sometimes six, seven, nine months. Then they'll do the next webinar. And then another three, six, nine months later, they'll do another webinar. And what happens is the sales cycle can be like this. Well, what if you could collapse that sales cycle? Think about that, the power of that. In Bruce's case, he did it in a month where he, he's done four trainings in a month. And guess what? Collapsing sales cycles. What would you have to do to collapse your sales cycle? What if those numbers hold true in your niche? Now, I don't know you, I, so I can't say this is 100% factual for every industry. It just happens to be that with the private clients we're working with serving multiple industries, we're seeing this almost like clockwork at 100% with our clients. Yeah. But what what could you do? What could your takeaway be as you're listening or watching right now for you? When would you want that to happen? Would you want it to be here? Or would you want to do what Bruce did and bring it here? Well, what's the shortest distance to make that happen? Anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it goes all, Dan, back to relationships, right? Recency. Yes. Because if you are going to go on a first date with someone and then you text them or call them, a month, two months, or six months later, how's that going to go? That's Terribly. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, I remember my wife, I would, I, we, I dropped her off on our first date and she's like, I go, when can I go on another date with you? And she goes, call me. And so I got in my car, started driving home and I called her. Like, <laughs> that's what I did. The recency is I, I waited five minutes. I didn't play this three day rule or whatever. I'm like, call her. Okay. I'm calling you now. When can we go on another day? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And that's what recency is. And the same thing with webinars, same thing with direct mail, whatever it is. So I totally appreciate you talking about that. The other thing I want to talk about, Dan, is um, you helped him with, you know, multiple iterations, like from the first one, just getting it out the door, improving it to what he's doing now. And specifically, I mean, there's there's so many things we could break down, but I wanted to break down. I know that you kind of cut down the presentation length. More specifically, you probably helped him with the offer. If you could talk about some of the components of a really good offer, I think that'd be really helpful. Whether I mean, people can apply that in a webinar to email, to direct mail, to whatever. So some of the components you helped him with in the offer section. Yeah. So at the, at the end of the day, how can, you know, you know, it's the idea of how do you create a irresistible offer, right? And as you're listening or watching, what is your irresistible offer? Do you have one or do you have several, right? You might have multiple products. Are they, do you have an irresistible offer built around them? If your stuff is not selling, right? It may mean you don't have an irresistible offer, not in your eyes, by the way, it's in your client's eyes. How do you know you have an irresistible offer as people buy it, right? And it's not about a selling system. It's about a buying system. And there's a big difference. Like Apple, as you think about companies in the world that we are, you know, can kind of connect to, is Apple, right? Apple has a buyer's culture. They have a buyer's system. Um, Starbucks has a buyer's system. They're both the high premium priced in their niche, in their category. But yet people- A new still, iPad comes out, yeah. boom, people are lined boom. up around the corner. Stand up, line around the, around, around the block, right? Just like that. It's a buyer's culture. So if you have an irresistible offer, the key is you know it by the fact that people buy it. So if you don't have that happening, then you might want to go back to like, how are you making this presentation in your client's eyes, in their view? That's what, you know, a couple of the keys in looking at building an irresistible offer. Number one, you know, it's got to be, you know, how do you make it where you can eliminate or reduce risk? Right. That's a really critical thing to think about. You know, especially in the times that we're in right now, depending on when you're seeing this, if it's, you know, uh, recently we just come out of the Corona situation, like making sure people understand it's safe. You may even, if it is local, you may want to speak to the idea it's local. You may want to speak to the idea it's customized to them, right? But safe, customized, you know, working together, right? In a safe way. That's, this is really, 
at the end of the day, people buy or don't buy for one main reason. Do you, do you happen to know what that is as you're listening? Do you know what it is? It took me years to learn this. Years. I still feel like at times I'm like, I got to make sure I, I, I'm really true to this. It's certainty or more importantly, uncertainty. People will buy or not buy based on how they feel with certainty or uncertainty. So what is your offer conveying that gives them certainty or uncertainty? And many times, if you just speak to the fact that it will give you certainty to do this, and what that means for you is this, and what that gives you is this, and what that will mean for you is this. Many times, you know, there's there's layers. Um, when you create this irresistible offer, so if you can eliminate or reduce the risk, that's a huge thing. Number two is you want to help create a, a, a version or a feeling of results in advance, right? How do you get people to feel like they're going to get results in advance? There's all kinds of ways to do it. This, this varies product to product, service to service, and all kinds of things. My very first company I started back in 1992, Jeremy, um, I was fortunate. I, I guess I fell into this to a degree by accident. However, I worked in a direct marketing, a direct mail uh, we work with direct mail TV and radio, as you know, you and I've talked about in the past in the late 80s while I was going through college in the summers, right, playing ball. And I fell in love with it. And I, I fell in love with the psychology and I fell in love with the, the whole concept of how you could put something out and people would respond and buy it like, like this, direct response marketing. And so when I started my first company in 1992, we, we serve uh, health club owners, right? And so if you owned a health club, and you were independent. So you couldn't be a part of like a big giant chain or whatever. You weren't a big giant chain. So you were mom and pop in a local local market. We'd come to you and go, hey, Jeremy, um, if we could show you a way where you could go out there and, and we'll bring you new clients. In fact, we expect we'll bring you a couple hundred clients in the next 90 days or less. And it won't cost you anything up front. Why? Because you might be asking that. Why is we're going to run the ads? for TV, radio, and direct mail. We'll fund it for you. And then when we make money, we'll split the profits. Would you be open to that? Boom, hit time up. That was our irresistible offer to open the door, right? And so as you think about like your irresistible offer, what could it be? One of our clients who's in the uh, uh, regenerative medicine business, right? We work with them. And, and another part of your offer is what makes you unique to the marketplace? See, if you're a me too product or you're a me too service, or you are communicating what your benefits are in platitudes, like everybody says what that, what that is, right? Then chances are you're going to have a hard time having it irresistible. It's got to be- We have the best customer service. Well, everyone says that. Everyone says that. Yes. Or, you know, we save you time and, and money. Everybody says that. Uh, we give you the ability to work more efficient and effective. Yeah. Everybody says that, Right. So it's got to be unique. So we have this process that, that we work with and, and, and happy to share. We'll put it in a link somewhere where you can download it, uh, this article that we put together around this. But it's basically there's four four critical parts. And not only will I give you the parts, but I'll share a couple of stories about it uh, as well. So the first part is you got to get clarity on your unique market. Right. Well, who do you really serve and encourage you to go narrow. Right. When you narrow down, you can actually grow up surprisingly. It's counterintuitive too. But if you will narrow down your market of who you serve, you will find that you will attract people outside of that too, which is probably what you want, right? But there's a resistance. So let me speak to the resistance. The resistance is, well, if I go narrow, I'm going to eliminate or block out people. Actually, if you narrow down, you actually attract people outside too. That's, that's the truth. But here's another way to think about it. who makes more money, the generalist or the specialist? See, if you're a generalist, you're me too. And you're going to get generalist fees. But if you're a specialist in a category of a market, narrowing down, you can charge higher premium yeah. fees. If you're like a pediatric neurosurgeon specializing in the neck, you know, as opposed to a pediatrician. Exactly. Yeah. Like if you go to your doctor's office and you need a tumor removed, do you want your uh, pediatrician doing that surgery? They're a doctor. Right, they're generalists for kids. Do you want that doctor doing the surgery? You might get a better deal than the, the brain surgeon. <laughs> a better deal, right? Dude, better deal. Like, yeah, not a good outcome, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, and do you want your doctor to come to you? Go, oh, I'm the cheapest guy in town. How do you feel about that? Think about it. think about it from a medical. Is and I'm speaking to someone who's a doctor, right? 
that's like your business. So focus on your unique market. What are you the specialist in? And then you will attract people outside of that, which again, you might not think that'll happen, but test it. Test it and you'll be pleasantly surprised, I'm sure. Unique market. Next is your unique message. What is it you can say that only you can say compared to anyone in the market, right? So you want to get clarity on your message, right? Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach, has this great way he describes this. says, those who name the game own the game. So what do you do? You name what it is that you do, which ties to the third step, which is your method. How do you deliver what you do? See, this in and of itself can transform your business if you just name it. Like you're getting an example. Let me just take you behind the curtain here for a second. I gave you one of our naming right here, the ROI squared. That's one of our frameworks. Why? It's easy to remember. And ROI squared equals ROI cubed, right? And it's also like confusing to it and not confusing, but it, it's a pattern interrupt, right? So what could you do to create a naming convention of something that then educates people and shows and demonstrates to people quickly and easily how you're unique, right? Return on implementation is another one of our naming conventions, right? Nobody else has had it. Return on implementation. What is return on implementation versus just getting an idea worth to you, right? So I'm not beating on my chest here to go, oh, look it up. No, what I want you to do, I want all of you as you're listening and watching this right now to be able to put this in place for you. It's so much easier than you've been led to believe and it makes you stand out. So now if you can come up with your unique market, your unique message, and how you deliver it in a unique way, your unique method of delivering and name it. Like one of our clients and, and Jeremy helped connect us actually, focuses in the regenerative medicine business. And in the regenerative, uh, re regenerative medicine business, at the time we got a chance to meet, he was serving clients, doing real, I mean, he's amazing by the way, in this industry, in this niche, he's like the best in class, the best in the world at what he does. He was serving clients at $500 a month. And at times he felt frustrated because they couldn't keep up with them. They wouldn't, you know, they didn't have the, the fortitude to be able to invest what you know, needed to happen for advertising to really grow and scale up, right? And so he found himself in many ways working with the wrong kind of clients many times, not always, but many times at that level. So we went and worked with him. We actually do this process and we have a day process that we do with companies. And we did this with his company and we walked through it, unpacked it, spent the day, came up with it. And he reframed his model as he calls it the patient infusion method. Let's think about it. If you're in regenerative medicine, wouldn't you want a patient infusion? So he has the patient infusion method or the PIM, pro PIM process, right? So name the game, own the game. He started putting that out in the marketplace that allowed him to go to $5,000 a month for his services. Not much difference in delivery of service, just the naming of it. But then there were also five critical steps, and we won't go through the, those for sake of time right now, five super easy steps that his company does that make up the patient infusion method. It's not just a name to have a name, but there are five supporting in his case, five supporting steps that make it up that now when he, his team, it's easy for his team to remember five steps and the name go, what makes you different? Oh, it's our PIM process, patient infusion method, step one, step two, step three, step four, step. Now when people hear that, they go, wow, I would, I would have never guessed it was that intense, that involved, made him stand out when you get a wow, right? What could you do? As you're listening, again, I don't want to speak to just them. How about you? Can you take action with this? Can you identify your, I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Do it now. Do it now. Figure out your unique market. What's your unique message? What do you say? What can you say that no one else can say that you do? What's your unique, uh, so your unique market, unique method, your unique method of how you deliver it. Then ideally, now you can have a unique offer. Like one of our clients, we work with Joe Polish. It's my belief system. Like if you look at his unique market, right? Who's his unique market? It's entrepreneurs right? Who are at a million plus a year who value contribution. Like that's a big, big place for, for genius network, right? And Joe Polish's community, what's his unique message? Helping entrepreneurs reduce suffering. No one had ever claimed that before. And when, when Joe shared it, people connected to it. So it was a unique message. His unique method is called genius networking. And he has a program called genius network. You know, there's, it's our observation looking at a company like um, like Dave Asprey. If you don't know Dave, you'll appreciate the, the process. And I'm not going to give the company because if you don't know it, you'll appreciate the process. If you do know it, just go with it, right? So Dave Asprey, he got in the most commoditized business in the world probably. 
the coffee business. So as you're sitting here and go, well, I don't want to narrow down. I, my customers are everybody. And if you're saying my customers are everybody, really, you got no customers probably, or you're struggling to get them daily, right? In fact, let me ask you, how are you doing getting clients daily? See, if you're struggling to get clients daily, then something's off in your irresistible offer and some of this stuff, right? So go to Dave Asprey. His unique market wasn't just people who drink coffee. He said, we're going to narrow. Now, he worked with one of the smartest marketing minds in the world, I believe, Mark Michael Fishman, who did his version of this. But if you look at what he did, his category of market was health enthusiasts or fitness enthusiasts who drink coffee. Isn't that interesting? No one had ever, I believe, I don't believe anybody had ever gone after that segment of the market before Dave did. And again, by narrowing down, it allowed him to expand out of it. Unique message. His unique message is get fit while you drink coffee. Who knew you could get fit while you drink coffee until he claimed it? His unique method of how to deliver it is called, do you know it? It's add grass-fed butter to coffee. Now, that had been around for 100 years. And MCT oil, yeah. Yeah, add yeah. grass-fed butter and MCT oil to coffee. That had been done for hundreds of years, but Dave claimed it. He popularized it, just like Richard Cook created the idea of 2080. Perry Marshall popularized it in many ways. Right? Or part, they partnered, but he really helped expand it. Right? So you can take things that are there that you can then just claim and work with, and you get, you get to popularize it as your method. He did that. That transcended into what's called Bulletproof Coffee, which today is now 100 million plus a year business, which now has transcended into all kinds of programs, products, services, and things called Bulletproof 360, right? What could you do with this? As you're listening, as you're watching, what could you do with this idea ROI squared, return on interaction, return on implementation, come up with an irresistible offer to your world? Going back to our friend in the regenerative medicine, we had a meeting here recently, and one of the things that we're doing is working on a new updated offer that instead of it being 5,000 a month per client, he's going to have the ability to generate over 60 to $65,000 per client by helping them double and triple their business. I won't go into the method because it is kind of exclusive to him, but when you get this right, you can grow from one level to another level to another level, and it allows you to open all kinds of amazing, amazing doors. So anyway. Dan, first of all, thank you. I could probably keep you on here for the next seven hours. I won't. Um, but I want to point people towards where they can find out more about you and your company. They can go to growth, growth to freedom.com and check out your podcast. They go to breakthrough three X.com anywhere else we should point people towards or within breakthrough three X. It would be valuable. Yeah. I mean, if you're struggling to uh, get, you know, clients every day, or maybe trying to simplify your business. What we did, Jeremy, we put together a toolkit that you can go get access to. You know, if you want to, you know, have your team do a better job of selling without selling, right? Using a unique method that we've been using for over 20 years that we grew our companies out of that grew to over 20 million a year. We'll give you access to our outline script to, to be able to do that, to give to you and your team. Uh, we've got a marketing plan checklist, you know, the number one reason, according to the SBA, that businesses go out of business is not having a marketing plan or not having one that works. So we give you a marketing plan checklist that you can use as a tool to update your marketing plan blueprint. You know, as you're thinking about it right now, when's the last time you updated it? What worked just 60 days ago isn't working today. So it might be time to update it. So we give you that. Like you can just have it. Uh, number three is if you're looking for a way to be more productive as the founder and CEO of your business. But maybe you consider yourself that hard charging creative type or the type of person who like likes to operate outside the lines or color outside the lines. And maybe you don't see yourself as a typical CEO or a typical founder of a business, right? Because of that, we put together this checklist for people like that, right? It's basically built for non-administrative type CEOs to be just a better leader in their business. And so you can get that checklist and you can go get that uh, to help you grow your business with less stress, right? To get you on track, to get more clients daily. Right, to bring you more clarity, certainty, and direction, go get that at activate.breakthrough3x. That's activate.breakthrough3x.com. Dan, you're amazing. Always a pleasure. Appreciate you sharing your knowledge. I mean, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this a couple of times just to hear, just to really get a sense of the offer, irresistible offer, and all the elements you talked about. So I totally appreciate you. Thank you. Great to be with you, brother. Thank you. You too. What I got. 
get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand 